Thank you very much for staying this late. It's uh, great to be back at Scala.io. My last time here was 2017, so it's, a it's been a couple of years. It's great to be part of the uh, French Scala community and in some small part participate in, in building it. So yes, my name is Adam Warski. I come from Poland. I work at Softwaremill. I will talk a bit about my company later as well. But our main question for, for this hour is that we, are, we will try to settle how are we going to write Scala for the next at least year or so. So we'll see. So I won't give you a definite answer. Uh, I hope to give you some arguments so that you can decide based on your personal preferences or uh, your project, your team. Um, so we will be dealing with IOs. Uh, I, the, the IO monad and the future monad before it is, I think, the dominant way now people write business applications in Scala. So uh, it uh, has evolved a lot in, 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 uh, in the uh, last 10 years. Uh, but now we have a new contender, which is Project Loom, which was introduced by Java. So there's a natural question that arises. Is, uh, uh, are the IO monads still relevant? Should we still use them? What are their merits? So we will try to answer this question. So, uh, before we get into actually code, let's think a bit about why did we actually end up with using IOs? So what is the main reason that we are actually programming with monads? Um, and I think it all came from uh, our need to increase the performance and the throughput of our uh, code, right? So, uh, a long time ago, like 10, 15 years ago, it was quite normal to have a thread per request model in a web application, for example, right? So a uh, request came and uh, you maybe called some database, you called some other service, all in a synchronous way on a single thread. But uh, this, uh, this approach didn't really scale very well, right? Because the limiting factor was the number of threads that you can run on your machine. And threads in Java are quite an expensive resource, right? They are expensive to create in terms of memory. They are expensive in terms of time because switching between two threads is actually takes a lot of time in, in the processor scale, in the CPU scale. So it was limiting our throughput, right? And you could maybe create like 200 threads to serve your web app, and that was the limit of the number of concurrent users that can be served. So people wanted to go beyond that. So uh, they came up with various creative ways to actually better utilize the threads that they are creating, right? We created thread pools, and we created, or we, uh, use these th thread pools to use asynchronous programming and asynchronous I.O. Uh, to actually uh, only use the CPU and only use the threads when they are actually needed. And if we are, if we are waiting for some external uh, event, uh, we will uh, actually wait on the side and the thread will be free to do other things, right? So, um, so we improved uh, the performance and the throughput of our programs using asynchronicity, and uh, more generally, we wanted to introduce more concurrency to our code, right? Uh, the, th uh, the web application example is just one uh, aspect of this. Um, in many cases, we want to do things concurrently, and this also, of course, involve, in involves threads, right? So these threads were a very precious, scarce resource, uh, so we came up with asynchronicity to actually use them better. Um, so, uh, as I mentioned, first we, um, first we started with the thread per request model, and then to ha now we know why we wanted to them, like how do we actually get to the IOs, right? So, first we had thread per request, and then we wanted to use asynchronicity, so we came up with the idea of callbacks, right? So, whenever our IO request completed, we, uh, the IO fr framework invokes a callback uh, so that we can continue. Right? But then we quickly ended in callback hell, so people invented the very helpful notion of futures. Right? Um, and that's not a Scala invention. There are futures in Java, there are futures in JavaScript and many other languages. In JavaScript they are called promise because they had to do, uh, it, it needed a different name for some reason. Um, 
But uh, then in Scala, we used futures for a long time, but we also improved on this concept, borrowing things from Haskell, and that's how we came up with IOs, which are lazily evaluated descriptions of programs, but still the main reason why we kept using IOs is asynchronous programming. Um, but now, um, Java 21 enters the stage, and they introduce something that's called uh, virtual threads as uh, the first part of Project uh, Loom. So, virtual threads, um, or lightweight threads, as, as, as uh, they are called, uh, they behave and they look very similarly to the old Java threads that have been there. Um, so, they, of course, they are created in a different way, but you use them in the same way. And the main idea is that you can have hundreds or thousands or even millions of these threads running on a single JVM. You couldn't do that with, with platform threads. You would run out of memory or uh, operating system limits very quickly. Um, so, these threads are very cheap to create. They consume little memory, and they are very fast to switch between. Right, so it's completely feasible to create a couple of these uh, for each uh, HTTP request, for example. Um, so that's one thing uh, that Project Loom introduced into Java 21. Uh, the other one is a built-in asynchronous runtime, uh, meaning that uh, Java now manages an internal thread pool of these old-style platform or operating system-level threads, and on this pool, on this uh, limited pool of, oh, time's up. <laughs> on this limited thread pool of uh, these platform threads, um, an arbitrary number of virtual threads are scheduled, right? So, and we have all this in the, in the JVM. And that's actually the same uh, what Cats Effect and Zio runtimes are doing, though these libraries, they are doing it at the library level, right? And here we have it at the JVM level. So, we can now use a different syntax that's not available to Cast Effect or Zio to uh, leverage, uh, to leverage um, these threads. And finally, the third thing that uh, Java 21 introduced is retrofitting all the blocking operations so that they are virtual thread aware. So, uh, before it was kind of forbidden to call a thread sleep, for example, right? Now it's completely fine as it will only block the virtual thread, as long, of course, as we are, uh, as we are running on a virtual thread. So all blocking operations, all I.O. Bl blocking operations, semaphores, blocking queues, they can be safely used again without compromising performance. Um, and the overarching goal of Project Loom is exactly the same as the reason for introducing futures in the first place, right? It's the goal of simplifying asynchronous programming. So maybe you can say that the goal of futures and so on was to introduce asynchronous programming into our code, and here we have the goal of simplifying it. Okay. So as an example, you can, um, if you try to start here, ten, so we've got an array of 10 million elements, and for each uh, element, we start a virtual thread, uh, and then we join it, so we wait until it completes. The thread doesn't do anything, uh, but starting 10 million threads on a JVM takes about two seconds. Of course, it depends on the machine, but that's still uh, very fast, right? So these threads are really lightweight, and they're very quick to run and schedule and so on. Um, yeah, and, and as I was saying, the underlying idea of scheduling multiple threads or multiple fibers onto a small pool of underlying uh, these heavyweight platform threads is the same in Loom and in Zio. However, the place where this is implemented is completely different, and hence the syntax that we can use uh, to create our programs is also different. And the, well, it's not only the syntax, really, it's also like the whole programming style that we can, that we can use. Um, and Project Loom um, set out to solve uh, three main problems. That's what you can at least find uh, from, from, from their technical reports. So uh, they saw uh, how cumbersome asynchronous programming in Java is using futures, using reactive programming, and they wanted to solve three main problems. So the first one is the problem of lost control flow, uh, meaning that you 
weren't able to use normal control flow constructs like for loops, while loops, ifs, thens, and so on when using, uh, when using React programming or futures. So that's the first problem. The second problem is of lost context. So um, stack traces in, uh, in when you are using futures are usually useless uh, because they only capture the very shallow part of the call stack. So they wanted to fix this. And the third problem was, vi was virality, meaning that once, uh, in, if you write some code and you call something that returns a future, well, the only sane thing to do really is to modify your method so that it also returns a future, right? So these futures or these IOs, they spread like disease into your, into your code base and you have to, in effect, uh, very often write everything with those wrappers. Okay, so and uh, I guess they mostly succeeded in, in, in these three areas. So summing up, once again, using, uh, using Project Loom, the thread per request model in a web app, for example, is once again viable. So now the question is, what happens to our functional effect libraries, right? So do they still have any merits, right? Because we can now do asynchronous programming in a different way. We don't need, uh, we don't need the, these library-based runtimes, right? Um, and the answer isn't, isn't obvious, right? Uh, these function effect libraries, they started as better futures in, uh, in, uh, in many ways, but then they also evolved and they added a lot of features which actually might uh, be very useful, and they are very useful. And they bring a lot of convenience, they, they bring a lot of safety to our code. So now the question is that we will explore throughout the rest of the talk as to what, what are these features and how, how relevant uh, they are. So we will look at error handling, resource management, refactoring, interruptions, high-level concurrency, and uh, a couple of other uh, areas. Um, so yeah, so which one to choose? Either the functional approach or the direct approach. So um, as, as I said, I will try to give you some arguments, but you will have to make up uh, your mind for yourself. Um, and there's a couple of uh, approaches which we could actually compare uh, in Scala. Uh, in the futures, we could, for example, take PECO. In the functional effect libraries, we've got Cuts Effect, Zio, and Kaio, which is a new contender, quite interesting. And in the uh, direct um, style, uh, we've got uh, the Ox library, which I'm working on. It's um, an experimental library exploring how far we can push the direct style paradigm. And Gears, which is written by Martin Odersky Lab, it's uh, a bit more focused on integrating with Scala Native uh, as well in, uh, in addition to the JVM. So its focus is a bit different, but otherwise it's quite uh, similar to Ox. So we will zoom in actually on three of those, well, two of those, Zio and Ox, and well, direct supplemented by Ox. Uh, but we will also take a look sometimes with Zio Direct, which is an extension of Zio and which helps you to write more readable code, as you will see in, in a second. So just to briefly introduce our contenders, first we have Zio. Zio is a type-safe, composable, asynchronous, and concurrent programming uh, runtime for Scala. The central concept in Zio is the Zio data type. Um, it's a data type. So, and it, uh, it's a lazily evaluated description of some computation, right? So nothing happens when you create these descriptions until you actually pass them eventually to some kind of evaluator. It has three type parameters, the environment, that's, so these are like the dependencies that are needed to run your program, the errors that your program might end up with, and the value that's returned by your code. And then, on the other hand, we've got the direct style programming. You can say that it's normal code. It's like coding as we were taught in kindergarten, in Pascal or whatever. It's much more imperative, definitely. Uh, but we are not saying goodbye to functional programming entirely. Uh, we still use functional programming, immutable data, expressions first, and so on and so on. Uh, but it's not pure functional programming. So you have to keep that in mind. Um, and sometimes the direct style will be supplemented by Ox, so that's the library I'm working on. Ox is a library for safe direct style concurrency and resiliency for Scala on the JVM. It 
takes care of concerns such as structured concurrency, um, exploring how we can do blocking streaming on the JVM, and generally various, uh, ut uh, ver various tools and utilities to make the direct style a reality and something that you can actually work with. Okay, so let's start our overview with a syntax overhead, right? So uh, we'll have a couple of such uh, comparisons and then we will do a summary. Uh, so here we have a couple of Zio methods. Uh, let's imagine we are launching a rocket into space. So we have some methods to fetch the passengers, to prepare the launch parameters, to attach some booster rockets, fuel up those uh, rocket stages, and then finally launch them, right? So each of those methods defines a task is uh, a Zio, an alias for the Zio data type. So each of those methods returns a description um, of a part of our program that needs to be combined together into a big description of, of, of launching a rocket. Um, so having these methods at our disposal, if we want to combine them, we have to use a for comprehension, right? And that's a central concept in programming, in the monadic style of programming, right? That No more Zio. My computer is still working, I think. Okay, it's back. Cool. So, uh, so yeah, it's the for comprehension is the central concept when dealing with monads, right? If we want to combine a number of methods in a sequential way, so it's a sequence of invocations that we want to run, we have to use the for comprehension, right? So here we simply call these methods one after the other, and. Uh, for example, uh, but now this stopped working. Okay, focus is back. Awesome. So if we want, for example, to conditionally run some code, then we need always the else branch with an empty uh, with an empty program description. If we want to iterate uh, over uh, all the rocket stages to fuel them up, we cannot use a for loop, right? We have to use a built-in for each method, uh, which is a variant of the traverse that was mentioned here, uh, which will actually sequence all these fuel ups in the proper in the proper way. So there's a quite high syntactic overhead. It's a completely different style of programming that you have to get used to. It's learnable, and you can you can get used to it, but it's a step that you have to take. Um, if you don't like the for comprehensions too much, you can actually use Zio Direct. Zio Direct is a macro, so uh, you can wrap your code now in the defer macro that's defined by Zio Direct, and then you can write a a kind of direct style code. So this code over here will be transformed at compile time into the for comprehension form that we have seen uh, that we have seen before. So now, if you want to actually evaluate at some point an effect, you have to call dot run, right? So this dot run can only be used in a defer macro. So now, what kind of code can be part of this? is kind of limited, so it's not arbitrary Scala code that can be. You can have some ifs, you can even use a, 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 a normal for each on a collection and pass in a lambda here, right? But that's about it, right? Uh, you cannot just pass arbitrary lambdas and use arbitrary collection methods. This won't work because the macro has like hard-coded support for ifs, for, for each, and so on. So uh, the Scala that you can use inside it is quite limited, but you can use it to to somehow simplify the presentation of your code. The downside is that you actually have to know the for comprehension uh, method before using the Zio Direct, right? So it's an addition that you can make your maybe code more readable, but it doesn't replace the need to actually learn about the for comprehensions. Okay, so now, oh yeah, that's the, the ifs and, and the iteration that I talked about. So now let's look at the direct variant, right? In the direct variant, um, again, we have the methods which we want to call in sequence. There are no wrappers. We got rid of all the IOs. We have plain old methods which simply do something, right? Maybe they, have, they read from the database. Maybe, maybe there are some side effects. We don't know from the type. But if we want to compose them, well, we just do, right? We just write the code. Uh, in a direct style, uh, we can use ifs and iteration normally. So, as far as syntax overhead goes, 
Uh, Zio is definitely high on syntax overhead. Direct style is low, and Zio direct is somewhere in between. Okay, so now let's look at error handling. Um, so in the examples going forward, as far as error handling is concerned, we will use the following hierarchy. We've got an application exception uh, with two subclasses, user not found and invalid password, so keep that in mind. So when dealing with error handling, I think there are two aspects that are especially important. The first one is how you can recover from errors, and the second one is how you can compose programs which throw errors. So uh, first, uh, how, does, uh, how do things look like in Zio? In Zio, we've got this dedicated type parameter which specifies what kind of exception or what kind of, of error our code might produce, right? So here we have some program, well, which will always fail, but that doesn't have to be the case. Uh, it fails with the user not found exception, and, but the uh, type signature is more general, saying that it can fail with an up exception. And we can now modify this and catch all errors, right? Um, so here we say that when this program actually ends reporting this kind of error, then we transform this error to actually say, ah, okay, that's fine, right? So it's a transformation of our programs. And here, by the way, you can see that Zio is not as bullet proof as it, uh, well, it's not bullet proof, period, um, but that's because of Scala, right? In fact, we don't catch all errors here. Th this will compile fine without any, um, any warnings, uh, but note that the failing program can report an up exception, and here we are only catching one subclass, right? So this might end up being a bug. And in a similar way, we can only catch some exceptions, and then here, uh, here we have eliminated uh, the possibility of errors, and here we have, we have not. So that's how you can catch errors. And yeah, and if we, if we try to run it, it will actually work. That's always nice to verify. Um, what's interesting in Zio is that it has two categories of errors, right? What we have seen in the previous slide were application errors, but there are also defects, bugs, right? So for example, here we have a program which is specified as throwing no errors. It's not possible that the program can fail with an error. However, well, it will always throw an exception, right? Because we cannot divide by zero. And that's a defect. That's a different type. And if we actually try to recover from these kind of errors um, by using the catch-all, well, this won't work, right? Still, the, the defect will be present when we try to run the code. If we want to actually run, if we want to actually uh, capture defects, uh, what we have to do is we have to use the resurrect combinator, which surfaces the defects as errors. Okay? So this distinction is actually quite useful. So we have application errors and we have defects, which are bugs, which will just bubble up until they are resurrected or they will simply end our code. Um, as, as far as, so that was catching errors, and now how about composing different errors, right? Here we have two programs, one which can end with a user not found exception, the second with an invalid, and if you want to uh, compose these two methods, uh, we use the same method of composing as before, so that's a for comprehension, right? And uh, Zio or Scala will infer the proper general type uh, that we can actually uh, our code now can throw both type of errors. So composing is really nice because it works ex exactly the same in the presence of errors as without them. So what about the direct style, right? Well, in the direct style, we can throw, ex we can throw exceptions. That's what we can do, mostly. Uh, notice that the signature doesn't really tell us that the, our program can fail. Right? So that's a really big difference. Um, we can catch those exceptions. Uh, we can catch some exceptions. Uh, so here, this will actually succeed, right? Because the exception is caught. The exceptions might not be caught. Um, so this like normal exception handling. Um, when it comes to composing uh, errors, again, simple direct style, nothing in the signatures. So, you know, composition is trivial, but then we don't get really any information as to what errors might, might happen. So you might want to improve on that and actually use an either for application exceptions, right? So you can say that uh, now our programs 
well, I can either return an app exception or a string, right? And you can recover from those errors. So we can say, you know, we are using pattern matching. You can recover from all errors. You can recover from some errors. It's a bit verbose. Maybe you, we would need some kind of helper methods to actually, uh, in the spirit of catch all and catch some from Zio, to actually improve this. But you know, you can make this work with either. Um, well, now the problem is that when we try to actually compose two methods that might end up with an error, uh, so both of these return an either, once again we have to go back to a for comprehension, right? So we try to escape from monads, and here we are back with a different monad. Maybe it's a simpler one, it's not asynchronous, it's just a data type, but still it's a monad, right? We still, we once again have to use those four comprehensions. Scala will, of course, infer the proper type and everything, but the fact remains. So what we can do is we can use boundary break, which is introduced in Scala 3.3, I think. It's a new mechanism uh, with which you can actually improve uh, the either uh, style code. Um, it's a bit similar in syntax to the defer macro from Zio Direct that we have seen. So here I have a get either. Uh, that's an implementation I took from Reddit that actually uses boundary break uh, underneath, and what we, ha what we have to do here, sorry that it's so low, um, we have to um, uh, wrap our code uh, block in the get either, and inside we can use the dot question mark to unwrap any errors that might happen, right? Um, so now it looks similar to Zio Direct. The mechanism is totally different. In Zio Direct we had macros. Here, with boundary break, we have something that's in the Scala most library. It's based on exceptions, but these exceptions might be optimized out by the, by the compiler if possible. Um, so these are both exceptions and context functions. So the mechanism is totally different, but the usage is in some ways the same. But also, it doesn't, it's not restricted uh, as to what you might do inside uh, the body of this function, you can do anything that Scala allows you to do. Uh, because it's not a macro, it doesn't transform your code. Um, so yeah, so that is an option. However, uh, either are still might be a bit cumbersome. So summing up, error handling, Zio uh, is a clear winner here. We have safe error handling. As for the direct style, I would say it's quite basic. And uh, I think it's really a, an open research question how to do error handling in indirect style Scala that still needs to have to get a good answer. Okay, so now uh, let's continue our exploration into stack traces, right? So here we have a series of methods that, uh, that are called in sequence, right? Uh, A fails and uh, yeah, D calls C, C calls B and so on and so on. So if we actually try to run this, like this a stack of four methods, uh, the stack trace won't be really in informative, right? You cannot really see what happened here. You cannot see that there, were, that there was an ABCD invocation um, in, in between. If we try to do it in the direct style, right, uh, using simple method invocations, the stack trace will contain everything that's needed. So again, it's down here, but it says ABCD, which is what we were after. So the stack traces uh, here, direct style is a clear, is a clear winner. One of the goals of, pro of uh, Project Loom was actually to fix those. Although so far we haven't used, pro we haven't used anything from Project Loom, we are just using direct style. Um, and Zio doesn't, doesn't look uh, that good. Okay, now let's look at function coloring. So uh, once again, let's say we are building a rocket. So we will have these helper methods. Um, we have a, a rocket stage, a rocket nose, and we want to combine a couple of these stages and the rocket nose into one big rocket, right? So the function coloring problem is concerned with the signatures of methods that, um, uh, the signatures of methods uh, that need to be there when you compose other methods, right? So let's say we have two functions, uh, one creates the stages, uh, and the other creates the, the rocket nose, and they both return the Zio data type, which describes how to actually create those things, right? So now, if we have an assemble rocket function, well, and we want to actually call both of these, 
the only thing that we can really do is uh, we need to type it as a Zio as well, right? And anything that calls assemble rocket will have to um, will have will have to be of type Zio as well, and so on and so on, right? So we have those two kinds of methods in our uh, in our application. We have got normal methods and we've got methods which are typed as Zio, and they cannot call they cannot call each other. Um, freely, right? You cannot call a Zio method from a normal method, but you can the other way around. So that's called the function coloring problem. Uh, in the direct style, we don't really have this problem, right? Uh, we simply call these two methods and the, uh, the type here uh, is unchanged. Um, so in Zio we have coloring, in the direct style we don't have coloring. Mm, it is debatable if coloring is good or bad. Some uh, people like it, some people don't. Uh, you might like it because the signature then tells you that if you use the desire methods only, for example, for side effect in computations, then the signature tells you that this method will have a side effect or might have a side effect, right? And that you might consider this as useful information or not. So, uh, I'm keeping with red and uh, for Zio and green for direct here, but that's not 100%. Uh, there's, uh, like there's no consensus as to how this should be judged. Okay, now let's look at another property um, of purely functional programming that is fearless refactoring, right? Um, that's something where functional effects shine. So let's say we have it will be a very simplified example, but I hope it will convey the idea. Let's say we have three effects here, right? First we print prepare, then we launch one rocket, and we launch, and we launch another rocket. And we've got, some re we've got some repeated code here. We want to get rid of repeated code. So what we do is we extract the fragment that's repeated into a value, right? So we say that uh, the launch value, the launch uh, value will, uh, will be this effect over here. So remember that in the Zio world, we only deal, we, uh, we only deal with uh, lazy evaluated descriptions of effects. Uh, so we can then use this value safely over here, and the effect uh, when we run things will be th still the same. So that's very nice. What about Zio Direct, right? Can we do the same? Um, so here again, we've got the defer macro, and we've got some dot run invocations, right? And again, we want to uh, we want to refactor our code so that the repeated parts are extracted to a to a common uh, to a common value. So we can try to do that this way, and it won't work because we have extracted the whole thing with the dot run over here. Right, so you might say, well, it's the wrong way to do the, the, the refactoring. On the other hand, it's, uh, I would say it's not that obvious. Well, now what will happen is we run the effect when we create the value over here. So we will first launch the rockets and, uh, and only then prepare. So we will launch them unprepared. Um, so of course, the proper way to do this is to extract the effect as the value, and then use it twice over here. So this works correctly. So once again, if you use Zio Direct, you actually need to know all about how Zio and how functional effects uh, work. Um, so in the direct version, um, we don't have any Zios, any uh, wrappers, and so on. We just have three times uh, an invocation of a side effect. And if we actually try to extract um, extract the common part to a value, of course, again, it won't work, right? Because the effect will be run when creating the value over here, and again, uh, I guess the... Uh, okay, it's coming back. I guess uh, the converter is tired as well. Okay, it's my f cell phone, sorry, <coughs> for some reason. Um, yeah, so, so this won't work. However, we can fix this as well, right? Um, if we use a def inst instead of a val, right? So uh, you might say, you know, we want to use a val, and we, uh, in, the f in the purely functional pro programming, we can use, we can represent effects as values and so on. 
And that's fine, but on the other hand, there is a, re there is a reason why Scala has both a val and a def. So maybe, you know, we can just use a def where it should be used. So here, like if we extract the common code to a method, things work just fine. Um, nevertheless, uh, in terms of fierce refactoring, in Zio, yes, um, effects and computations are represented as values, so you can refactor with much larger confidence. That's a property known as referential transparency in a simplified form, and in the direct style, you don't really have it. Okay, so now we will finally get into some, uh, something maybe more uh, interesting and more involved, at least. So let's look at resource management, right? So in Zio, we can uh, represent resources uh, using a dedicated constructor. And so here we specify, so to create a, a resource, we need to specify how a resource is created and how is it released. So here we are allocating a file input stream and we are saying how to dispose of that resource. And uh, we get a Zio data type, uh, which says that this computation can produce a file input stream, but it needs to be run within a scope. And this scope defines how long the resource will live. So that's an important requirement. And now we can write some code which uses the resource. And to do that, we have to use the Zio scoped, right? So when, uh, so the, uh, the resource will be created over here when we actually try to use it. But when the scoped effect ends, the resource will be released. So we are safe in using this resource and we can be sure that it will always be released. Um, and we can also compose multiple resources, right? So here we have a method which actually allocates a resource. Um, it's a, we, we know it's a resource because it requires a scope. And we can compose two effects using resources in exactly the same way as we compose all other Zio code using F4 comprehension. And the resources will be released here when the scoped effect, which ends here, ends, right? So that's all, that's all very nice and safe. So now in the direct style, what can we do? Well, the first thing that we can do, of course, is use a try finally, right? We allocate the resource, we use it, and then finally we close it. So that's uh, a construct we all know. Um, alternatively, we can use something that's in Scala to make this a bit shorter. So uh, you can use the using uh, helper methods to actually open the resource here, and uh, it will be. Uh, and this resource will only be open when this lambda uh, is evaluated. But you can also do this, and the compiler won't do anything to you, right? There won't, won't be an error. There won't be a warning. Uh, notice that we are not closing the resource here, right? So. That's actually bad, right? So if we are disciplined enough, we can make resources work great, but if we are not, they will be, they will be closed. The, you, of course, you can shoot yourself in the foot in the Zio version as well, but as long as you use the Zio constructors to actually create, re, to actually create resources, you are safe. So here, there's no dedicated construct for resources which would actually watch your back. Um, now, composing resources is also a bit more cumbersome in the direct uh, version, because if you, ha if you have, here's the using, uh, but we, it's the same with try finally, uh, if we have many of these resources, uh, it again starts looking like a Christmas tree from the callback hell that we all know, right? So that's something probably uh, not, that's not so great, especially if we have a list of resources of unknown size that we want to allocate, right? So then we would have to do some, some uh, helper functions maybe or something like that. However, uh, that's where Ox, the library that aims to supplement, uh, supplement direct style um, with various utilities uh, comes in. So in Ox, the basic building block is a supervised block. So supervised blocks are mostly used for structured concurrency, and we will talk about it in a second, but they can also be used for, re for resource handling. So the supervised block defines the lifetime of the threads that are created here, but it also ensures that any resources that are used inside the scope will be closed when the supervised block ends. So here we are using two resources very similarly as in Zio, right? However, you know, you have, you, again, you won't be warned by the compiler if you try to uh, create a resource without using this helper method and without attaching it to the, to the scope. 
So summing up, in Zio we've got safe resource management, in Ox, so-so, or in the, the direct variant. Okay, so now let's move to concurrency, our final part. So let's say we have a child process, right, uh, using Zio first. So the child process, what it does is it sleeps for a second, it prints working, and it does so forever, so it's a loop, right, which will forever sleep and work, sleep and work, and uh, we are forking it, so we are creating a fiber which will run this in the background. So that's our child process. Now our parent process, what it does is it starts to work, then it starts the child, right, so this, style, uh, this starts the background fiber, uh, we wait for some time and then we fail the parent process. So what happens when we actually run it, right? So now we start the parent process, we catch all errors, um, and we wait if anything is happening. So what, uh, you probably don't see it at the bottom, but what will happen is the child will work for three seconds, the parent will fail, but the child will continue happily working because nothing interrupted it. So that's not probably what we wanted, right? We can fix this with a slight change if we fork the work, the parent process, and then we immediately join it, things will be different. Because in Zio, if a parent fiber dies, it also interrupts all child, fi uh, all child fibers, right? So now what happens is the parent process starts, it starts the child, it waits for three seconds, it fails, so the parent fiber fails because we are in a fiber here, right? And it also interrupts the child fiber. So the change is very small, but the behavior is completely different. So uh, there is some supervision in Zio, but I wouldn't say it's always obvious how it works. Now, how does it work in the direct style? And here we will be using Ox. So here we've got a description of a child process. So the child process sleeps, uh, don't need the semicolon, it then works. Uh, we have a helper method which will loop this forever, and then it forks into a, into a virtual thread. So now, what's important here is that we cannot just fork arbitrarily. We need to actually be inside uh, a concurrency scope, let's say. And uh, the fact that we are inside the concurrency scope is expressed by uh, this implicit parameter over here. So this aux uh, value uh, is a witness that this method needs to be called within a concurrency scope, and then we can fork it, actually. So now the parent, what it does is it starts a supervised block. Uh, it will, again, start to work. It will create the child fork, right? We are within a supervised block, so this uh, here is a context function, so the implicit is provided to the child. So it's allowed to fork. We sleep and then we end with an exception. So the way these supervised blocks works, um, and uh, that's also how structured concurrency is implemented, is that when this block ends, it's guaranteed that any fiber, any, sorry, any threads that have been started within that block are terminated. They might end successfully, they might end in an error, but we won't go past the supervised block, we won't exit from it until all threads have completed. Right? And the structured concurrency property says that the structure of your code determines the lifetime of, of the threads that you create over here. Okay? So um, when, the, when the, main, uh, thread, the main thread of the supervised block here ends with an error, it will actually interrupt all child uh, threads and it will end um, only when these threads are su successfully in interrupted. Um, so yeah, we can try to, um, to run it and it will, it will work as expected. So in uh, summing up, in Zio we've got some supervision, not always obvious how it works. Uh, in Aux we have supervision using structured concurrency. Okay, now let's look at interruptions, another topic related to concurrency. Again, we have a child process, same thing. It works every second, forever, in, in the background because we fork, but we also try to make the child immortal by uh, resurrecting all errors that may happen when evaluating these effects and catching them and just logging some errors, right? So we try whatever error happens when the child is working, we try to make it immortal. So what we do in the parent process, uh, we start the child, we wait for some time, 
and then we interrupt the child process over here, right? So now because in Zio interruptions are an out of bound signal that's sent to the fibers, uh, this will work correctly, right? So even though we made our child immortal, we have successfully interrupted it, so the child will stop working after the interrupt is processed. So what about the direct style now, right? Again, uh, in the direct style, we've got a child which sleeps, works forever, and is forked into the background. Uh, as well, we try to make it immortal, so we catch all exceptions and we print line uh, here, we, we log errors. Uh, the parent process uh, creates a supervised block, so that's the scope uh, in which the forks are allowed to live. It uh, starts the child process, so this forks a background thread, sleeps for some time, and says bye, so now the main thread has finished. The whole supervised block uh, tries to finish as well, so now it will interrupt all the child processes. However, what happens is that the child catches the error and continues working. And that is because in Java and in our direct style and in Ox, interruptions are implemented as exceptions. They are injected into uh, this thread over here, right? So an interruption is the same as injecting an exception. And if we catch all exceptions, uh, they will simply be caught, we will also catch interrupted exception, right? So the way to fix this is to not catch interrupted exception and to only catch non-fatal exceptions, for example, right? And now things will work, will work as expected. So it's a simple fix, but again it requires discipline to actually work with this correctly. And if a library that you are using, for example, ha catch, has a catch exception inside it, well there's not really much that you can do to fix this. So it might actually be a problem. So the interruptions uh, in Zio are implemented in a very principled and safe way. In direct aux, uh, they work with uh, some reservations. Um, and finally, let's look at high-level concurrency uh, tools that we have at our uh, disposal in Zio, right? So let's say we have three methods over here, and what we want to do is we want to update the metrics, and at the same time, we want to raise two computations. We will raise looking th things up in the cache and looking things up in the database with a timeout of one second, right? And using Zio, uh, it's trivial to write these kind of concurrent computations in a declarative way, right? It's the best kind of concurrency because you don't see it, you don't have to deal with locks, with semaphores, you can, cannot actually accidentally implement a deadlock uh, or a race condition. Uh, so if, if, we, if we manage to avoid concurrency, that's great. And that's what we managed to do here, right? We have these high-level operators like uh, zip par and race and timeout, which actually are concurrent, uh, but you don't have to deal with it. Um, and that's, that's one of the things that Zio is really particularly well known for. But it turns out that we, actually, uh, we, we can actually implement the same kind of operators using the direct style because uh, virtual threads are so cheap, right? So it's not a problem to actually create a virtual thread. So we can you know, implement a par method which takes two chunks of code and, and evaluates them in parallel. We can implement a race method. So the race method, what it does, is it starts two threads, right? One thread for the first branch, the other for the second, and whoever wins uh, interrupts the other branch and, and returns the result. It's all safe because of structured concurrency, which we talked about before. So here, all in all, both are, I, I guess, equal. Maybe the aux API isn't on par with Zio, but in theory, it can be done, at least. Okay, so summing up, why, why, why does this lead, lead us? So both Zio and virtual thread-based libraries actually solve the problem of asynchronicity. They solve it in a different way, right? Zio is a library which, uh, which has a custom uh, runtime for evaluating the effects. Uh, Ox is a very thin, thin layer on top, of, on top of Project Loom and, and uh, virtual threads, and it uses the asynchronous runtime that's built into the, the JVM, but both of these actually solve the asynchronous problem. So uh, it's not even included, maybe it should be included at the top, right? Like asynchronous programming uh, three times green. Um, so 
what we did is we, is we looked at all the other aspects that functional effect systems and purely functional programming give us uh, so that we can compare like which solution is the best for us, right? So um, on the Zio side, uh, on the Zio height, on the on the Zio side, we've got high syntax overhead, which might be troubling, especially for newcomers. Uh, not that useful stack traces, the virality of the data type, but on the other hand, we've got great error handling, we've got safe interruptions, we've got a safe resource handling, and referential transparency, right? But the direct style also has some good and bad side, right? So in the direct style, no, no referential transparency. We might potentially have unsafe interruptions and we might potentially have unsafe resources. We don't really know yet what to do with errors and how to best deal with errors. However, the code, I guess, is much simpler. Uh, there's much lower syntax overhead. The stack traces are useful. There's no, no, no uh, coloring and we've got uh, proper supervision using structured concurrency. So, before we finish, I've got three more things actually. Uh, so first, uh, I promised to tell you a bit about my company, so now is the time. Uh, they are, um, uh, I'm, the reason I'm here, they are paying for my uh, ticket, they are, uh, we are also sponsoring a lot of open source development in Tapir, so I, uh, I hope it's fine to, to at least mention it um, a bit. So what we are doing uh, is we are a consultancy, we are a technology partner uh, for many companies out there. Our specialization uh, revolves around Scala and Kafka, and that's where we do most of our consulting. However, we implement systems end-to-end -end using whole spectrum of, te of technologies, not only Scala, also Java, Kotlin, TypeScript, machine learning, AI, and so on, and so on. So if you're interested, take a look at our, at our website. We've got a very interesting technical blog where we try to post a couple of blogs, actually, per week, I think. We also maintain a couple of open source projects, uh, many of them in Scala, such as STTP, Tapir, ElasticMQ, and others. I've got, actually, if you're a Tapir user, or if you want to find out more about Tapir, uh, I've got five uh, Tapir mascots over here, so you're welcome to take them. Uh, after the presentation, if you would like. They're quite cute. Um, so yeah, so that's, that's the first thing I wanted to mention. So yeah, if, if, you know, if you would have any kind of technical problem, contact us, or if you have a business problem which would need fleshing out in technical terms, we are also uh, the place to go to. The second thing I would like to mention is that if you don't have enough Scala, please come to Scala in a month. It's a conference we run in Warsaw also for 10 years um, in March or April. This time it's in March, so take a look. And if you'd like a discount, uh, let me know. A third thing, we are running, uh, we are also running a weekly Scala newsletter uh, called Scala Times. So if you're interested in Scala news, please subscribe. Uh, Krzysiek is the main editor and also my coworker. He's also the co-maintainer of Tapir, compiles a new issue a new issue every week. Okay, so uh, a couple of links. I will make this available somehow to you. It's on uh, GitHub. So I've got uh, two presentations that might be relevant as well. So the first one I did is on uh, effects. Uh, this one deals with various effect systems and is an overview of, eff of effect systems. So it goes in a bit of different direction than what we talked about today. The second is an overview so that's from functional Scala and that's from Scala days. The second is an overview of various concurrency tools, toolkits uh, in, in Scala, uh, so PECO and Zio in a bit more depth. Um, if you will, in, if you're interested in the Ox project, take a look on GitHub, it's open source, you can try to use it, although it's in version 0.0.16, .0 I think, for now, so it might change still, <laughs> but feedback is welcome, and if you're interested, please start the project, it always helps. Um, and yeah, and Zio has a great website with documentation as well. So I think with that, yeah, that's, that's all that I have. I'm on Twitter, I'm on Mastodon, Blue Sky, which I created last week, I think, and or even before that, but last week it went out of beta, and LinkedIn, and probably some other means as well. So yeah, that's all I had. Thank you very much.
do we have time for questions? Okay, cool. So, if you have any questions, of course. No questions, so you want to go home. Okay, so if you would have any questions, feel free to find me afterwards or re reach me out online. So thanks again.